talk about today is uh, how to scale data migration. And data migration on its own sounds like a pretty boring thing. Um, data migration between file systems is normally something that you avoid at all costs. It's tedious and it's not that exciting. But this is HPC, and so things are not as always straightforward as what they should seem. So a bit of a quick overview of some of the things we're going to talk about today. Um, first of all, what is the storage in NCI? Um, very quick overview is we have some, as part of, some of it is through the RDS program, but as part of it is through our, just our normal partnership collaborations. Uh, we have some very large persistent data stores that reside at uh, disk resident here at NCI. Um, they usually are 50 to 100 terabytes, and that's actually why some of the tests shown later on in the presentation are around these sizes. Um, and some of the larger data collections exceed two petabytes. Um, one of them at the, the current time is sitting at 3.4 petabytes of GDAR3. But some of the numbers when you need to look at them is the file sizes can go from a few, few K to a few terabytes, but the overall storage capacities is also something you need to be aware of. Is we store in 451 million items collectively across the GDAR file systems. And if you think about my file systems where I big full, I need to free up some space. One percent on GDAR1 is 74 terabytes. So if I need to reclaim 10 percent on my file systems, it's a bit of work. So just shuffling that data around starts to say this is not a trivial problem. These data collections are also high value, they reference data. So when we're moving them around between file systems, we need to respect them. We need to make sure that what we copy is accurate and what users and research communities have been trusted us with is we are actually accurately storing that. Very quick overview, because you may have seen this slide before. We've got our three broad tiers of storage, tape and archival data systems. We've got our GDAR consistent stores that are available across the entire facility, and our origin file systems. What I'll talk about today is mainly about the GDAR file systems, which is these persistent stores, this long lived data and how to actually deal with growing capacities. So, a very quick overview of what uh, some of our capacities, our speeds and feeds are. So, our slowest file system has got a 54 gigabyte a second read uh, performance peak through to GDAR2, which we can hit up into 120 gig a second. Um, so, some data, data migration drivers. Why do you do data migration? And the answer is not because it's fun. It's definitely not fun. It's very stressful. Um, but there's a few things that we can do along the way that make it interesting. Um, but the reason we want to do this is we want to, most commonly, we want to get off an old file system that's being decommissioned. One of these systems has a, a three to five year lifespan. So at some point, the data that's on there is going to have to be removed from there. Uh, we may want to move a data set or a project to take advantage of a new feature. Some of our file systems run last to 2.3. And the new ones run 2.5. Maybe we want to take advantage of some of that. Maybe it's got a different performance or security profile. Or that uh, we actually just need to rebalance this capacity. Some projects have actually started from zero bytes and have grown to a huge size today. So when they were first allocated on the file system, there was enough room to accommodate them, but they've now outgrown the overall capacity of the file system. So we need to rebalance that. We might also want to do some duplication for data protection reasons, some of the reasons that fill up on it. And the other thing is that we've got these very large um, seven petabyte in size master file systems that are all between 12 and 18 months apart in age, which means that we've got this continual rolling replacement schedule ahead of us in the next mm -hmm. couple of years. So this data migration problem is not going to go away. Three years ago when I walked in to NCI, it was August 2013, um, we've just come off a uh, July, we've just come off by you our previous HPC system. It had 800 terabytes, we had an original GDAR amount of there, and it was 900 terabytes. I've estimated some of the speeds, it uh, wasn't actually able to benchmark them, and the project was around 1.4 petabytes. So, in the space of three years, we've gone from 2.3 petabytes of capacity um, to over 22 petabytes uh, as a persistent stores. In that time, we migrated over eight petabytes of data and hundreds of files. Um, so that's, to, that's three years. What does three years from now look like? Um, we need a better approach. So we actually, when you sit down and think about this, we actually have a high performance data problem. This is a genuine HPC problem because 
we look at some of the attributes about this, we've got petabytes of data, millions of files. We need to actually read and write and verify each um, file in that data set. We need this to be accomplished in a reasonable time, which is why we usually have big problems and solve them on HPC. And this normal sequential or linear approach just isn't going to be cut up. We need something that's going to scale. So let's have a look at a quick view back at the performance profiles. So one of the things we've got is some HPC resources at hand. Um, this is, within Rigen we have a main cluster, but we also have a test cluster within Rigen. It's exactly the same as the main system, except the main system is 3,592 nodes. The test cluster is a subset of that at 36 nodes. And these are fairly well spec machines. They all sit on the same VDR fabric. But what that is, is because it's a test cluster, it sits outside of the regular HPC cluster. So we've got 576 cores at our disposal and about 180 gigabytes a second of bandwidth onto the computer band fabric. This looks like something that we can use to help solve this problem. This is a shared test cluster. This is primarily designed for the HPC team to evaluate scaling codes and to test the queues. However, occasionally I borrow some time on it. Um, the main reason why is I can SSH between nodes, which some of these tools require, and we need to be able to run it root. If we're actually moving other people's data, we need to go to super user to be able to access that data, unless we're part of that group, but I don't want to be part of everyone's group. Um, and we don't want these admin jobs, if they fail, to uh, actually knock out a node and take a user job. <coughs> and we don't want to block, we don't want to fill up the main production queue from doing their job. For a data migration, we want to be able to do that silently in the background with no one really noticing that we're there. So the way we've all got this connected up is each one of the GDAR file systems has its own collection of LNAP routers and its own UVAN fabric. And so all of the HTC nodes can see those appropriately that. So some of the idea of what we've got going on here, GDAR one is OSTs, there's a lot of OSTs in it because they use two TV drives. But we can get three or four hundred megabytes a second out of that under a non-intended situation. GR3, a lot better performance because it's on your hardware. So some of the considerations and planning going into a data migration. What do we need to think about? The file system bandwidth. Our admin activities, we don't want to clob up user jobs by stealing all of the file system bandwidth. So we need to be considerate of others. We want to draw on them, and this is really important. I have broken things multiple times. Um, thankfully, most of the time in the file systems we're in pre-production testing. Um, you will break something because what you're doing here is you're exceeding data IO patterns more than what a normal user can do. Unless they have a very, very well-tuned HPC application that has a very nice IO profile. The other thing we're going to do is run through. <laughs> you know the old saying, measure twice, cut once. Uh, it's the same kind of thing here. You, you're running it through multiple nodes at speed. You put the wrong path in, you flip your source and your destination around, that's going to be a really, really sad day. <coughs> the other thing is the data set. We, and really, so you can figure out how much work you've got ahead of you, you need to figure out how the file size is, what the distribution looks like. The other thing is to build yourself a test data set, which I've actually done for this presentation, because what you can do with the test data set is manipulate that data at will under a defined set of conditions knowing what the expected behaviour was versus the actual behaviour. So this is also, the, one of the applications is actually an MPI application. So we treat it like any other HPC job. We don't go for crazy things because we're running over multiple nodes. Any one of those nodes might have a memory failure, a power outage, any sort of issue that can normally affect the HPC job. So we need to break that down. And the other thing is that I'm not actually the owner of the data. Um, I'm actually shuffling around for people whose research is there. So we need to come up with a time when we're going to perform these data migrations. So if we have a look um, on, this is on GDR3 and using uh, the Robin Hood report tool. And it's showing us some uh, file size distributions here. I've anonymized the project codes to be project one, two, and three. And what you can see is we've got a lot of data that's averaged inside between that 100 and 200 megabytes in size. And you can see that there's a lot of it. Uh, the one down the bottom is 200 megabytes in a single project there. Um, so these are very large projects. This is what we're basically moving as a, we typically move it a data migration as a whole project. So data migration tools, um, this is one of those things, how many different ways do you want to do 
whilst it does have certain fault system and fault system verification mechanisms, but we're not going to look at this in this presentation. This is really around moving the data set between the fault data between the fault system. Um, and that's kind of what the project's managed here. What we'll do is bring on a new fault system. Um, still no, we bring on a new fault system, GDAR 3, and the first project to move on there was GP6. We moved that on and it was kind of a test. We had that one project on there, we knew that we had a problem going into early production on that. We had one project to deal with. We then have a level of confidence and we then bring other projects on board. Um, we have ways of determining who's suitable to move first. So what I've presented here is a couple of viable options. Of course, your mileage may vary. So, of course, we've got traditional CP. CP works well, not too smart. Um, you need some manual handling to, to wrangle some performance out of it. Same goes for RC. Traditional RC, it's been around for years. My entire working career as a system administrator, RC has been sitting there lurking behind me. Um, we've used it in many different ways. Great thing, where RC starts to struggle as is the fault sizes start to creep up and the actual fault system bandwidth starts to move along. Um, it doesn't scale up so well, so you need to start to get tricky and start to wrap some scripts around it to make it behave like you want to. The other option which Phil mentioned in his presentation is around FPC, which is using use their part PC. It's effectively got some automation and uses this idea of FPART build these file buckets and it has its own queue manager to dispatch new tasks to waiting processes on those over XSH. Um, underneath it is still using RSync, which is both a good and a bad thing. It means that you can feed it any of your normal uh, RSync options, um, many, many options in RSync, you can spend two days or even an page. Um, However, it's got some things that don't work so well on Luster. One of the ways that RC does is it writes a file and then swaps it in. You can avoid that by using the in-place option. However, dash dash in-place is not compatible with sparse files. And in HPC, you tend to encounter a lot of sparse files. So you have to run without um, in-place on, which causes a, a large number of rename operations than you'd ideally like. But it works. The next one. This one's actually my favourite, we'll see why in a minute. Um, DCP2, it's out of some work that come out of the US National Labs. These guys have huge file systems. They were already a couple of years ahead of where we are in terms of their file system sizes. It's an MPI application, it scales well. I actually joke and say that it's one of our best scaling um, IO intensive HPC applications. You'll see why when you look at its IO profile. It's also an MPI application, which means that if a node that any one node dies or has starts to have uncorrectable memory faults, you will fall over. And I've discovered that one of the nodes in the test cluster did have a lot of memory faults while doing this, and that's the way that this works. Um, it's going to stress your hardware both in the compute side and on the storage side. And so some of the things you can do is our test cluster has 32 gigabytes of memory per node, and we've actually blown that out. So what you have to do is run <coughs> the number of processes running on each node. So each system has 16 cores, we normally run 16 processes. In some cases I've had to scale that back to 12 to deal with the memory requirements and then set the MPI bind to options to make sure that we nice and balance that. Um, but it has a limited number of options compared to RC. Not as fancy, but it goes fast. <coughs> so I've built a test data set based off the idea of 100 meg files. We've built up a couple of bins, created a lot of stuff. So what we can do is um, consistently shuffle some data around it's the same data set, and if I break it, no one gets upset. Um, the files are just that created out of dev uran, and creating a lot of data out of dev uran was a painful process, but um, we got there. So collectively, we have about 400 terabytes of, of uh, dev uran data sitting on the file systems um, for this purpose of this test. So first of all, let's break out a traditional CP and copy one of the one terabyte buckets out of 10,000 files that terabyte. A traditional CP, one process running for that terabyte, 66 minutes on one compute nodes. This is a luster to luster copy over infinity band. Um, so CP works. And when you look at IO top, I was seeing between 290 and 340 megabytes a second, which is pretty good, but we're going to need to scale this up. We can do that, we can build this, we can split, we can shell script the life out of this, but that's a lot of work. 
So traditional last week, I would have another hit, but we're still going on the coming over here this morning. <laughs> so I just go, yeah, okay, whatever. Um, when we look at R Sync running um, with an IO top, uh, I don't, what you'll see is R Sync sitting there faithfully chugging away at somewhere between 40 and 100 megabytes a second. It really feels like it's getting, it's getting on. Um, it can take a long time, so we need a lot of parallel R Syncs to get some action happening. So let's go. Let's, uh, so R Sync and CP on their own, probably not going to be cut for the, the pet, pet scale. We go to the medium scale test. This is 10 terabytes, a small project at NCI. Um, these file counts are about right, 100,000 files. So we can use FPSync. FPSync has this idea of buckets. We need to form up these buckets and give it a few hints about how to distribute this work. So you need to figure this out ahead of time and then you pass it these parameters. The command you run is something like this. You'll note that on all of these for DCP and for FPSync, I'm actually teeing that and I have to run it within a, set, a screen session. You don't want your SSH session to terminate and mm -hmm. whole thing to fall over, run it in screen or TMAX or whatever your choice is, mm -hmm. and also tee it out to a file because this thing is going to spew thousands of lines and scrolling up in screen is not going to be very much fun. Um, FPC, 16 nodes, 512 processors, uh, 52 minutes. Not too bad for 10 terabytes. Let's use DCP. Same, so exactly the same source and destination. Uh, we're going to use all sorts of calls per node, and we've got 16 node fed. We set it up, pass it these parameters. Wait goes 10 minutes, 52 minutes down to 10 minutes for this guy. And it, it, you can see there is what some of the output on the screen looks like. It actually has a couple of phases where it goes through a, drip, a directory walk where it's actually figuring out work to distribute to each node. It then goes through a file creation phase, and you'll see what this does to your metadata server image. Then it goes through a copying phase, which actually copies the blocks, and then it does a set attribute um, option on it, which brings everything into alignment. It's kind of like a normal CP with preserve uh, attributes option. So what you can see here is a side-by-side -side comparison with DCP. So this is an aggregate throughput of the OSTs on uh, the left-hand side is GR1, uh, the right-hand side is GR3, source and destination here. What you can see is there's obviously some baseline background I.O. going on. Uh, DCP is way out in front. And what DCP is cracking there is it's effectively driving uh, somewhere between 15 and 20 gigabytes a second. So, re uh, a quick review of that. 52 minutes versus 10. What happens if we run FPSync again? Because FPSync is just RC underneath. It's quick, three minutes uh, for three seconds with no data change. But it's got a really nasty gotcha. Uh, this actually happened on a real data migration project, which was the project was scheduled to move, and at the last minute, one of the projects decided to load in a whole lot of data, extra baggage, and trip over to the new file system. And the way FPC encountered that is a lot of the new data ended up in a limited number of the worker buckets, which meant what it ended up result running was a small number, I think it was eight RC processes, then it had to deal with something like it was 20 or 30 terabytes of data on their own, which meant it would come back down to um, ordinary RC performance levels. So let's scale this up, 50 terabytes. Okay, the average project size here at NCI. We're still using 16 nodes. Away we go. So 50 terabytes, 41 minutes. This is quite acceptable. You'll notice that we've gone from 10, um, 10 to 50 terabytes, but we haven't had um, around about five times this performance yet, so we're scaling quite well. This is what it looks like in your OSS. It's a uh, time to give it a bit of a pounding there. And this is on the 50 terabyte half million files. This is looking at, very hard to read this because the green lines, unfortunately. Uh, GDAR 3, so this is on the destination. What you can see here is the create, copy, and then set attribute phases. <coughs> you can see that this is a lot of metadata activity, but this is nothing compared to what's coming next. So let's scale it up again. Let's go for the 400T. This is, we're actually starting to get somewhere now. Still
still using 16 nodes. Um, I'm at the moment competing with these that are in the <coughs> test cluster. I'd love to scale up to 32 nodes. Um, I'll put 32 nodes in the actual published slides. Um, we're sharing the test cluster at the moment for um, some of these work on his own presentation. So 16 nodes, we're going to go for the 4 million files, 400T. 5 hours, 51 minutes. This ran last night, so I kicked this off at midnight, and by the time I come in this morning, it was done. Uh, what you can see there is that it's, uh, that's a huge look on the screen. Uh, it's handling about 20 gigabytes a second for the whole transfer. Uh, this is what happens when you say 4 million files, tell me about them. This is on the source MDS. MDS uh, one on GR1 peaked 2.4 million get out as a second. Um, so if you have a look at our MDS spec, this is why they run 768 gig RAM. Um, because most of this get out attribute, oh, these get outers are being served out of memory. Um, the load average on this machine didn't even raise a sweat while this was getting done. Um, I can do this, an ordinary user can do this. I'm doing this with 16 nodes. We've got 3,500 nodes. However, things didn't quite go so well just shortly after midnight when I kick this off. Look at the Zappos event. You can actually see this chart going down at the time. I'm like, no, 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 what's wrong? What happened was we actually did an IO trigger um, set up in Zabbix on uh, NOS 62. That's one of the OSSs in GDA1. It was the IO subsystem was just massively oversubscribed on that particular OSS. There is around about 5,000 4K IOs going on in the background at the same time as this. That may have contributed to that. And they had a couple more of these events. So what I'm doing here is actually starting to push that particular OSS on GDA1 pretty hard. So we have to do the data migration process in very broad terms. What we do is we set up a quota. So when we actually deliver the project under the new file system, they're not instantly over quota. Um, and then they've got sensible quotas there. Each project, many, not each, but many projects at MCI have an NFS export out to the cloud. So we need to stop that NFS export before we move to the source directory for the export. If you don't do that, you fill up your log files in your NFS server. It's pretty bad. Uh, we moved the project into a restricted access directory, and so, for example, it's only root accessible, and we make it fairly obvious. So anyone who's got root privileges and goes in and modifies data in there, um, I'll track them down pretty much. Um, so we move the data in there. What that does is it prevents any changes to the data being committed any further. We then um, typically break up a 400T uh, data migration into smaller projects. If my 400T copy last night failed, I wouldn't have a slide today. If it was 400T, I would have overshot a user data, I would have overshot the migration window. So what we do is make it break up into smaller DCPs. So if an individual run fails, we wouldn't have to redo that, that run. So it's 400, we might break it up into 4 by 100T DCP runs. Um, we then do a compare and check sum. So comparing the checks, I mean, DCP is very, very accurate with the data that lays down between the file systems. I've not actually found an error to date where it hasn't written the data correctly. But we want to be super confident about that. So one of the ways we do that is you can simply do this with some shared computing. Build a use find. I have many finds running. The MDS is contained it. Run many finds and use a printf statement in your, in your finds. Dump that out. You now have a large amount of text. All you need to do if you've got a text diffing problem, diff the two text files together. Um, this is done on a machine with 256 gig of RAM. Um, it works quite well. It takes about half an hour. Uh, then that gives you a diffed output, which will give you the files that are mismatched. Now that may be a mismatch on its attribute, or the data may have changed. So what we've got that we've got a very small list of files. We just give that to uh, RC, and it takes a little while and shows on that. Typically, this is less than 10 files. Most of the time, it's not. Um, one of the other things that we've got here is we've written, right, Muhammad in the HPC team has put together his own MPI based MD5 sum. So we use FPART to build a list of uh, files on both the source and the destination. We just fire up the MD, uh, MPI MD5 sum, and it will compute a checksum on every file on the source and the destination. We just dip it out with there. So it's giving you fully MD5 checksum you both the source and the destination. So once we're happy with that, we move the data out where it can see it and read the NFS exports. The source data continues to 
to live in that locked away migration source directory for usually one to two weeks after we do a migration. It's purely there as a safety rollback mechanism. Should have something gone wrong and you've missed it. We've never used the safety rollback. The mismatched files, any idea what causes them? Early on we had a bug on the cluster where changing a modification time attribute where you gave it a large number of, hey, go and change the, the modification time on these files. This wasn't just one or two files, this was like a couple hundred thousand operations coming at you. It would miss some of them. So it wasn't the data wasn't corrupted, it was just the mod time wasn't set correctly. So we got that in one fixed problem solved. Um, so in practice, what does this look like? Uh, a year ago today was when a project called R4 moved off GDATA 1 onto GDATA 3. The time was 2.4 petabytes. Um, just shy of 40 million files, completely moved end to end, verified in under 48 hours. So we're talking about two pet over, nearly two and a half petabytes of data moved in under 48 hours. I think that probably classifies as a scale data migration. We also we hit a bug in uh, DCP2. Uh, Andrew actually <coughs> fixed it up. Uh, there's got an upstream commit on that. Uh, where <coughs> Effectively, DCP would lock up on some copies. We had a problem with the, some of the MPI barriers there. Uh, that fix is committed and available in DCP2 today. What would I do in the future? Um, so, Luster HS7 integration, that is a big one. What happens if we need to migrate off tape? Uh, so, we've got an HS7 copy in place. When I'm migrating from GR to whatever N to X, and they're both HS7 back, I don't have to recall the tape. We need to do some more work around the scale and the validation processes. And I, every time at the moment, I have to borrow the HPC test cluster. GDATA 1 is coming up for retirement and it has 24 Dell R620s there, uh, all with FDR and Finiband connections. That 